practice makes perfect. We're not looking for perfect, right? Because mm-hmm. perfect today is not perfect tomorrow. Life is dynamic thing and it's constantly changing and evolving. So don't look for perfect because perfect is evolving as well. Yeah. Uh, but what we must look for is progress. And I mm-hmm. think that if you can look back on any journey, including a microgreen journey, if you can look back and say, yeah, that's that's progress, you know, I'm reaping the benefits of what I've sowed through connection and through communication and through community, uh, th- then you've done something that truly has a wonderful impact. Welcome to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we have Ashley Hackland from Metro Greens in Johannesburg, South Africa. This was a really fun episode where we talk about how Ashley manages running her microgreens farm while also running a full-time education business. We'll touch on Ashley's gut-fixed meal plans that incorporate tons of microgreens into healthy meals that has also increased demand for her microgreens in her local area, and so much more great advice in this episode. Let's get right into it. Hey, Ashley, welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited to have you on. And I know this is going to be a fun one. So thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks, Jonah. Awesome to be here and uh, super excited to connect with growers around the world. What what an opportunity. Um, Yeah, so I am a microgreens grower in South Africa, Johannesburg. This is my third year of growing micros and uh, ever impressed at how the business evolves. Um, Yeah, what what a fantastic thing to be part of growth, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think this community is very unique um, and really it's it's really blossoming because microgreens become so, so popular and, you know, and it's it's just getting more and more popular. But I'd love to hear how you first got interested or found out about microgreens and then how the backstory of your farm, Metro Greens, came to be an actual farm. Do you know, no, uh, Janet, just like most people would uh, would be looking into some sort of vegetable garden at some stage, I have a beautiful space upstairs. If you've seen how I grow, there's a large patio with a yeah. beautiful view over a green belt, um, which is a bird sanctuary here where I live. And... Uh, I always wanted a rooftop garden. So then, okay, you climb on the Oracle, Instagram, rooftop garden, and gardening, uh, then the algorithm starts speaking to you, and all of a sudden I've got microgreens all over my grid, and I'm going, oh, okay, I want some microgreen. Um, And to be fair, I I knew what microgreens are. I, I came from a restaurant background, and I didn't understand their nutritional benefits. So, of course, you do some reading and some research, and to find out their nutritional content was, I mean, just astronomical, up to 40 times. We all know this fact, how lovely. Um, I thought, wow, that's really special. But what truly caught my interest was the sulforaphane content in micro broccoli. So very dear to my heart. I've, I've had a few family members uh, with cancer. And uh, Yale University in the 70s discovered that sulforaphane was a fantastic anti-cancer agent through its antioxidant um, and anti-inflammatory properties. So yeah, I became like obsessed with micro broccoli (laughs) uh, for personal growth and what a wonderful product, you know, it was beautiful, it's flavorsome, you can use it in anything Um, and I thought I have to share this with my community, whether it's restaurants or health coaches or or just individuals directly, this is something I really want to get out there. and so I did. <laughs> you know, Metro Greens is, is my second business, um, but it's one that, yeah, ever evolving, ever growing, and you have to remain innovative. Um, yeah. And, and it was a journey. I mean, I've done the markets, I've, <laughs> I've done the products, I've done, I've done what, I, what I felt was necessary at the time to expose my brand and, and, and grow what I'm doing. Of course, it's competitive. Everybody uh, is, has a fascination at some point or not. So if you've got any kind of green thumb, 
And even then, I recommend that people try it. It's, it is it's a phenomenal, you know, superfood to have bright and ready uh, available for you. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, <laughs> Thank you. In, 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 I'm, I'm just curious, in Johannesburg, um, have you found it difficult to educate people when you started your business? Or did you find it was pretty, like, people knew about microgreens before? Like, how, how was the kind of market demand prior to you starting or when you started your business? A great question, Jonah. Um, you know, I think it depends who you're speaking to. If you're speaking to chefs, they know what they want. Yeah, they, they want to cut a certain way. They want it at a certain length. They want a certain look. They want the basil leaves to just, <laughs> you know, they, they know yeah. what they want. Um, whereas your, you know, your everyday person off the road or off the street maybe needs a little more education perhaps. But I think that that's just in general population, in, you know, to say we all could know a little bit more about eating well and, and having a more balanced diet. Um, so, yeah, it depends who you're speaking to uh, is, is my yeah. answer to that one. I, I think um, any, anyone who's enthusiastic about nutrition and eating well and serving their system and really maximizing on the energy derivation that we get from our food um, – comes from, uh, uh, yeah, a thirst for knowledge. So if you're speaking to people who want to know, um, which is generally my followers, <laughs> it, it, it's easy, then it's good, you know. Uh, yeah. And, and as a natural educator, I'm, I'm always happy to share information. I think it's so important. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think, I think one thing that I'm still learning uh, but I've, I've, you know, been on this journey for like a health journey for a while is, you know, when you eat food and then your stomach feels good and you feel good, it's a pretty good sign that it's good for you. Whereas, yeah. you know, if you're eating foods that are deep fried and, and, and in oil and, you know, you feel like yuck after, um, you're, you're, it's, it's probably not going to be good for you. And one thing, one thing that I've realized recently, I was in Mexico recently and there were some like phenomenal restaurants, um, and the food was so good that I would, I would often overeat. And when oh. you overeat really, really healthy food, I didn't realize how much of a difference it is compared to overeating unhealthy food. Like you can eat over, you can eat overeat healthy food and still feel great after. Like you don't get that like heaviness, um, which is something so interesting. Yeah, yeah. So um, just something that like, you know, microgreens, I've never heard of anyone eating a salad with microgreens and being like, oh, my stomach is just... <laughs> not feeling well so, you know, like it, it, it's just so nourishing to your to your digestion it's it nourishing for your like all your Bio, muscles and, and brain available, easy to digest you know because the stems are so tender they haven't filled up with um you know the cellulose that you see in all the plants so yeah. all you've got is the good stuff straight from the seed everything contained required for life, you know, all the essential amino acids, enzymes, your vitamins, your minerals, you know, a little, a little seed has it, everything. And then you trap that plus phytonutrients in the first development of those tree leaves. What a beautiful process. Now, yeah. look, I mean, do we get as much food? Here's the contentious point is do we get enough food for the seeds that we are germinating? Of course, if we allowed a full tray of seeds to go to maturation, you're going to be able to feed a lot more people or a lot more yeah. calories. Is there a bit of a, a standoff? Yes. Well, it is, it is a premium food. You know, it's not um, that you need a lot of it. It's uh, that they're, they're so, you know... They're, they're so nutrition, nutritionally dense that you really truly need a handful a day. So there are two sides to that fence. What, what, what are we focusing on? Um, yeah. Personally, I harvest the microgreens. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I totally agree. I think, I think there, it's important to kind of recognize both sides because you're definitely right that, you know, if you took this, let's say you took one broccoli seed and grew it to a head of broccoli, you're going to get more calories more total nutrition be, like than the one broccoli microgreen because you're growing it to maturity. It's absorbing all the nutrients from the soil. But what I've realized uh, in my career of farming is like people don't realize that growing food is resource intensive. Like there's no, like there's ways to make it more efficient over time. 
But having said that, growing food and especially growing high quality food is going to take more resources in total than growing a lower quality food, which is why like mass manufactured food doesn't taste as good because it has less nutrients in it, but they can mass manufacture it. Um, and it can sometimes be more, more resource efficient. For example, let's say you grow an uh, orange tree and you just <laughs> plant a seed in a, in a, you know, some random soil in, in some forest somewhere. It'll grow a tree. It'll probably get some fruit. The fruit won't taste very good. It probably won't produce as much fruit. Whereas if you plant it in like really high quality soil, you're adding the nutri nutrients it needs to grow properly into the soil. You're taking care of it. Uh, you know, you're going to, you're going to get a much more nutrient dense orange than if you just throw a seed in the forest and hope for the best. So it takes more resources to grow high quality food, which is something that I think, you know, we just have to learn over time to get better with resource management, but at the same time, recognize that like we need to utilize the resources we have to grow high quality food because it makes everything in life better when you're healthy than when you're not healthy. And so if you're yeah. eating like calorie dense foods that aren't nutrient dense, you're not going to feel as good if you eat lower calorie foods that are more nutrient dense, generally speaking. No, I, and I, I totally agree with your point. And if I can add to that, I mean, it's not just us who are looking for optimal health and, and the best nutrition and, and, and. It's, we are facing a food and water crisis on this planet with our overpopulation. So if we can develop a technology or develop the knowledge to be able to grow super nutrient-dense food, um, it, it could help in some way to at least uh, alleviate what what the planet is facing ultimately. Um, yeah. So yeah, high, high quality food, some of it experimental at this stage. I mean, who knows? Maybe if someone figures something out about microgreens, we don't know. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> it'll, it, I can guarantee it will happen. I can guarantee it will happen. I, and I'm excited. I'm excited for that to happen because, like, there's a lot of, like, I learned with my farm being in the city, there's a lot of young people that are really passionate about growing food. And vertical farming, growing indoors, makes it possible again for the young younger generation to get into farming and there's a lot of smart people that want to innovate and revolutionize the industry so i can guarantee it'll happen when it'll happen i don't know but the more people that get into farming uh the more of that innovation will will happen well good on you yeah keep keep spreading the good word but you know i find it interesting that you talk about indoor vertical farming and i think canada um because of your climate it really requires that indoor space yeah. <laughs> Whereas uh, the biggest grower in South Africa, uh, or in, yeah, the biggest grower in actually, I think the Southern Hemisphere, I mean, they're enormous, um, grow everything outdoors in greenhouses because of mm -hmm. our climate. And so what we see is a lot of people coming into the industry or becoming, you know, new time uh, or first time microgreen growers or just trying to like, expand on their hobby. And they have the indoor kits, but then they scale up into a warehouse with indoor and the cost of it is just between the load shedding and what, I mean, the other crises we, we face in South Africa, um, <clears throat> indoor farming just becomes that much more costly than growing outdoors under a greenhouse. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's a fine balance, I suppose, and it, it absolutely depends on where you're at. So you have consistent... Yeah energy available look i don't know what your your power costs are in canada i, I doubt Very they're cheap. comparable to ours yeah ours are yeah. exorbitant um but we keep the lights on nonetheless you know south africans have a die hard spirit so uh <laughs> we we are we are a how can i say an innovative nation <laughs> Resilient, I would say, for sure. Absolutely resilient. Absolutely yeah. resilient. And, you know, um, ultimately, I think I've seen quite a few fellow growers fall over the years. And it's because they cannot compete with the big outdoor growers who have the tunnels and, and, and. And hence, I mean, for me, it has been a process of evolving and innovating within my own business. Um to to make it work for my community so yeah yeah for sure yeah i think the the biggest the biggest growers i've seen are generally like the really really big scale ones are generally greenhouses because the scale up of vertical farm 
uh, you like you like you said, it's very expensive. Doesn't mean it can't be done. It doesn't mean it can't be done properly. There are farms that have done it. Uh, it really just depends on where, like you said, your location. So in places like Canada, generally, we're going to tend to move towards more uh, indoor vertical. One, because like most of North America, uh, at least Canada, the U.S., electricity prices are very inexpensive uh, compared to Europe and when where, where you are. Even Mexico, I was surprised at how expensive electricity is. Having said that, my greens are a very profitable crop, so you can still make it work. But then oh, it just absolutely. starts leaning, it just starts leaning more towards like, but when you're, when you're com- but when you're competing with someone who's able to sell it for almost the cost at which you grow it, that's a problem. That, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, and I and I think that that's where we're at here. So you know, I think all microgreen farmers have this: do we expand or do we? What you know? How how does this work? What is the perfect ratio? What is the perfect number? And I think that that depends on your business, right? So yeah, um, I know what I need for my customers weekly. And over the years, I've had so many people reach out and say, "Hey, Ash, would you would you mentor or would you offer help or whatever? Would you tell? Why don't you do a course?" I get asked so often, and I just think. There's so many courses out there, right? It's, I'm, I'm not looking to compete in that space. Um, and frankly, <laughs> I teach teenagers all day. I don't know if I could be teaching adults. <laughs> yeah, I know for sure. I think it just depends on, on everyone's context. Like for me, the reason I made the course with Freedom Farmers was because I saw that there was a lack of specific information on how to do things in, in a more efficient in creating a higher quality product. Um, so it wasn't like, oh, like I want to, uh, you know, just do something like do the same thing that already exists. Like there's no point in that. So if, if something already exists, there's no, like, I, I don't see the value, like I'm not adding any value to the world. So you have to do something different. So that that's just like, it's the same thing with my greens. Like if you're doing something different than this big grower, uh, which we'll get into about some of the meal kits, there, there are different benefits you can you can offer and create your own niche so the way i think of it is like yes there might be this big grower in south africa that's like dominating the market but there's so many other niches uh and for example in north america there's aero farms which like so many farms are concerned about they're selling the whole foods to you know kroger's to the big grocery chains in uh the u.s but all the small health food stores uh are like they're not selling there so like Aero Farms is operating here with these big growers and these and small farms have an opportunity at this other level. And it's not better or worse. It's just a different level of production, a different level of operating. And there's lots of opportunity in these other levels rather than like worrying about this, like a big grower that you don't have to directly compete with. So you can if you want to, but I think that's going to be a losing battle. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I, and I think that this is this, is that you've got to find your groove. So when people ask for a course, I, I typically say, you know what, you've got to find your own niche, your own path, your own, what your community needs. I mean, I can't go in and say, this has now worked in my community, copy, paste, you can do it in your community. So in South Africa, we've got nine different provinces and each province sort of has its own flavor. I don't want to make that assumption that what works for me works for everybody. You know, South Africa has very different regions with very different businesses that will work yeah. very differently. Um, so I'm, I'm hesitant to say to someone, here's how to do it, and then it doesn't work. And then they're like, well, my Ashley, it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, there, so- there is a lot of crossover, but yeah, there is every market is going to be slightly different. Like sometimes, the, a product that you think will be really popular in one market is not as popular in another market or, you know, or they're depending on what other growers are there. So there definitely is regional differences, but overall I find that like the general growing and selling can be like for the most part, pretty standardized. And then there's like all the small niches that you want to create and those type of things that, that you kind of have to customize for you in particular and how you want to run your business. Every market is different. And I think, yeah, it, it's, the persistence and the resilience to just keep trying, right? So what works? Yeah. Um, and for me, I said to you, I've, I've done the pestos, I've done salad dressings, I've done, you know, dehydrated sprinkle, <laughs> um, tonics, and, and having done all of these products, 
and standing at markets and selling these products. Oh my goodness. And, and that's huge. I have to tell you, I have enormous respect for, for vendors at markets. It's, neat. Yeah. it's a mammoth task to prepare because it's not just microgreens and you've got the pestos and you've got your full product range. And this is once a week. Oh my goodness. It, it was a lot of work for one person. So, yeah. Uh, and then you're still growing markets. microgreens. You know, yeah. it, 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 was, it was a lot. Um, and I just felt like, no, my time could be better served. And also I had, uh, anyone who knows me knows my dogs are like my kids. Um, and last year I had a very sick dog for, uh, she passed away in June. And I really just wanted to be at home with her. I didn't want to go and spend my mm. weekend standing at a market. You know, as much as I yeah. love talking about microgreens, I, I would have preferred to be home with my penny. Yeah. Um, and, and so I took the decision to lean towards sort of meal packages, gut fix packages, as I call them, and really showcasing the microgreens and some flavorsome meals that serve mm. our system and, our, and give our digestive tract a, a break from everyday stresses. And inspired by a dear friend of mine who is a, is a vegan, <laughs> and whenever she'd come for dinner, I'd challenge the table to eat vegan because I think... You know, it's not one person arrives and now they must eat different food to the rest of us. We're gathering together and that's what food is about. It's about that social connection. And how are yeah. we connecting if we're eating different food? No, we're all going to eat vegan and you're all going to love it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, f I found a lot of people, um, if if the food is good, that that's really what, what matters. Like there's a few people that are like, oh, it's, it, it doesn't have meat or whatever. Like I'm missing this or that. But most people that I've encountered that um, all they care about is the food, the food tastes good. So if it tastes good and it's healthy, that in my opinion, I think that's a huge win. Um, yeah. It sounds like at the farmer's market, you sold a whole wide range of products, which is <laughs> very, very interesting. What did you kind of settle down into in terms of like your product lineup? So like what what you sell microgreens which i'm guessing yeah, so product, product lineup at the moment i've removed so i used to make a micro broccoli pesto and a micro basil pesto um uh, you know i did the green goddess dressing which is amazing i had an olive tapenade with micro broccoli through it i told you i had like a micro broccoli obsession for a while yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh and then <laughs> Because I just wanted everyone to have sulforaphane. I thought this is the best yeah. thing in life, you know. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I still do, but now we do it differently. So I just actually last week removed those products from my website. Um, it's simply, it's not where the business is anymore. And, uh, yeah. you know, after 18 months of, of doing this process and working with many repeat customers, they've come back asking for microgreen meals. Um, and because of, of my skill and my history and restaurant background, I'm able to offer it, uh, mm. which, is, which is great, right? So yeah, yeah. it really has been a, a marriage of all of my skills. I get to educate, I get to grow, I get to cook, um, and, and it's all done with an impact or with the idea of having an impact on my community for the benefits. I've decided to open my kitchen to customized gut fixes, still enriched with microgreens, probiotics, prebiotics, of course, and enzymes, but um, allowing people to choose their own variety from a, a from That's many. cool. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah. You know, with the repeat customers, I'll inevitably have someone say, gee, you know, I really loved the smoothie from day three. Could I have that for all of my breakfasts? So every mm -hmm. Sunday I have my to-do list with a thousand notes of, you know, this one wants this and this one wants <laughs> And I love being able to offer that. So, yeah, so we've decided to, well, I've decided to formalize it on my website. Um, and so we evolve even further. But what I love is the awareness that Gut Fix brings to microgreens and the benefits. So people inevitably mm. feel more energized, they feel lighter, there's less bloating, um, and they've had a really good week of food, you know. So they yeah. come back and they say, gee, can we do this again? Or, or can we just 
order microgreens from you because adding the microgreens to my regular meals also makes me feel good. Um, yeah. So, you know, educating people through gut fix about microgreens and their benefits rather than just trying That's to sell awesome. them a pesto product. Everybody's got a pesto product, like pesto is pesto. <laughs> and to be fair, when someone tries to sell me a pesto, I always think oh, I make it better at home, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, that that's cool. Um, so what what like what percentage roughly of your business now is like microgreens versus the gut fix uh, meal kits? That's an interesting question. Uh, I I would probably put it down to a forty sixty split. Okay, cool. So forty, so 40 microgreens, sixty percent meals. Um, but I'm I'm cooking a lot here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, no, it's, it's, I'm really it's cooking a lot, a lot. so um, yeah, still really happy with my microgreen numbers. Someone actually, a fellow grower who's decided to close their operation, phoned me up uh, a week or so ago and wanted to offer me their customers, how very generous. Um, and so, you know, you look at the capacity and can you adjust, can you accommodate the, the new business and absolutely. So I prefer that sort of organic growth on the microgreen front where chefs are speaking to one another. It's sort of word of mouth. People know. People know what I do, yeah. they know the quality, um, and, and that sort of speaks for itself. So I'm happy for that side of the business to grow organically, um, and I'm not going to push it too much. I, been to so many restaurants and I've taken so many samples to chefs and I, like, yeah. I, feel, like I feel like I've done it. <laughs> not... with, with with those potential new customers, do you, you have enough capacity to produce oh, uh, in your current space? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's never an issue to add a rack or two with a couple of lights. Um, it doesn't hurt to expand and like I said that organic growth allows you to do it bit by bit so it, you can build your farm over time if you're a new grower it's not like you have to get all the fancy kits in one go although when I yeah. started I did you know when I started growing microgreens I was like oh this is gonna be just like a little oh, so easy cheap cheap no problem and then I yeah. oh but look at these lights and then oh but look at the racks and then oh look at the and the next thing you know the X that you thought you were spending ends up being like a 50 X. <laughs> Look, no, regrets. But with that comes more sales. Yeah. 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 No, no regrets. I, I would do it again tomorrow. Uh, it was a happy spend and very exciting. So here we yeah, are. <laughs> for sure. Awesome. So, so you do have, you mentioned you do have a, like a full time, I don't know. It's full time or part time no, uh, no, teaching. No, no. Full time. I, I, Traumatized teenagers from 8 a.m. until 5, 6 p.m. Uh, it is so, my absolute joy. <laughs> uh, so how, how do you kind of fit in the microgreens work? And, and like roughly how many hours does it take you per week to, you know, to get everything done? Jonah, I'm so fortunate to be able to work from home, which eliminates time and traffic and nonsense, right? Um, yeah. I also don't need staff meetings. <laughs> so there's there's a whole lot of stuff uh, due to the nature of my teaching. So I work from home and I work predominantly with homeschoolers in the morning and then I work with schoolgoers in the afternoon. Um, and I give myself breaks between students to get things done. So. You know, if I've got a 15-minute gap, I'll soak some seeds or I'll reach out to the customer. Or uh, if I have an hour break, I'll go and do some shopping. Um, it, it all just depends on the schedule and, and how it flows. And it does seem yeah. to just get done. And if I'm really in a bind, then it's an early morning. Um, you know, then I'll start a lesson early or I'll... I don't know, plant the microgreens early. But I do have a sort of grow cycle that it adjusts with the scent, with the seasons. Hang on. Out. So in winter, of course, we have a longer grow cycle, which means my, my so dates change ever so slightly. Uh, oh, but okay. I'm, at a point, I'm at a point where I'm sort of planting daily uh, just to be able to offer 
daily harvests. Um, yeah. And I, I do like them at a certain length. I don't like them to get too big. You know what I mean? It's, uh, yeah, for sure. I think I'm, I think I'm, I, and this is maybe some snobbery on my, <laughs> but I think a micro should be a micro. Like, what are you doing serving a half juvenile plant? It's <laughs> yeah. Um, no, the, for the sure. Yeah, it, it depends on, like. yeah, it depends on the micro. And I feel like, like some of them, like a basil, for example, if it's just the first two leaves, the flavor is not as developed yeah. as an example, but I totally know what you mean. Like, you know, if you're like, I feel like if anything, most growers grow them too small instead of too big. But generally speaking, um, yeah, because like the cotyledons can get pretty large uh, before the true leaves come out if it's grown with like strong enough lights and good good soil and stuff like that. Your so radishes, seen, for sure. Yeah, especially something like radishes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, no, they, they need to go when they, I mean... No true leaves on those. Um. Yeah, yeah. For sure. So, do you, do you find that? Uh, so, you're harvesting every day. So, you don't have like one day where you have a, like a big harvest. So, I do have two, three days a week, which are big harvest harvest days. Um, and then throughout the week, I've got people reaching out who would like three turbs or five turbs or so. It's sort of in between harvests of big. Yeah. Harvest. Look, I'm busy God. and I'm home all the time. Yeah. So when someone phones up and they're saying, hey, Ash, can we get some microgreens? And I'm like, you sure, no problem. Or I don't have stuff. I mean, it's it depends. Um, yeah. But, I, yeah, I, I love sort of the relationship that I've built with my community and, and that it works like that. So, awesome. yeah, it, it's so, not a hard and fast look. <laughs> we we yeah, just go yeah. with the for sure. Um, in, in terms of like, so it, so it sounds like broccoli is definitely the most popular microgreen you grow. I think I can answer that question for you. Uh, but beyond that, is there any like exotic or unique varieties that um, that that you do grow or that you've tried growing that mm. you've really liked? So I grow a red amaranth. I don't know if you get it there. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I love the red Beautiful. amaranth. I think it is so lovely. I do keep it especially fine, though, um, so I don't let it go to that deep purple color. I keep it like quite a pinky color right at the beginning, and it mm -hmm. acts as a beautiful fluff almost to very fine dishes, which chefs quite enjoy, and also mm -hmm. I enjoy using in my gut folks. You know, amaranth's so good for you. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't say that's super exotic, but. Oh, you know what I struggled with was uh, lemon balm and blood sorrel. Blood sorrel and I, if I throw the seeds in my garden, they will grow like weeds for days. Okay, no problem when they're out there not getting any care or concern. But the minute I put them under a light with some heating and a fan and I make it sweet with the worm wee water, oh, yeah, no, won't grow for love or money. So, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what the blood sorrel is about. I, I, I've never grown a successful tray of blood sorrel. I just can't do it. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're definitely a, a tricky one for sure. Well, I don't know. Whoever's getting it right, like kudos to you. <laughs> it's not for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love the nasturtium. Uh, always so pretty and the different varieties, particularly with that little pink lip. It's very, very beautiful, and that wasabi flavor adds to your your sushis, um, your ceviches, any any sort of fresh seafood. So, oh, what else? Oh, basil for Italian cook. I mean, it really, what are we cooking? Then you got to ask me what my favorite yeah. thing is. You know, they're all good. good they're all they're all flavorsome. They're all beautiful, um, and they all have their place. Like in a ramen bowl. I love a radish. Uh, you know, radish is radish is radish. I feel like sometimes it's a bit overdone. But um, and through a ramen bowl, just to add that little kick, I think is it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah, yeah. I've never, I've never tried with ramen. That's actually a good idea. Um, yeah. one, one thing I was just thinking of, given your climate, um, I, when I was in Mexico, the, there was a farm. The far, I, There was one microgreens farm in the small town I was in, and they had – uh, some edible flowers growing on their balcony. And it was really cool to see like in a warm climate, you can pretty much just like have 
what most people would consider like ornamental plants as edible flowers and be able to offer that in your salads or chefs. And it's like almost no work because you just go outside, pick them, uh, and you don't really need to maintain them. So edible flowers in northern climates is really a pain and because yeah. uh, you have to grow them indoors and then the pests and the growing time and the cost of electricity just make it really difficult. But in a climate like yours, edible edible flowers, you can grow them year round. And it's just yeah. something that I think that would be a really cool addition to um, your, for example, when you mentioned nasturtiums, I was like, I love nasturtium flowers. They're one of my favorite things to eat. Um, but the growing season is so short here that to grow them outside, it, you get like maybe two months of actual flowers. Whereas in your climate, they probably grow like weeds. Yeah, no, they. I've actually got one that's cascading down <laughs> the wall at the moment full of flowers and it, you know it's probably that plant has probably been going for about two years so it's wow it's super variegated between a red and a orange i'll have to send you a photo it's so pretty um and they are delicious and they are very pretty but we also struggle with pests huh and then it's outside ah, cool. and there's hail damage and then there's too much rain so i've grown cornflowers and barrage um nasturtiums i i have done the flowers <laughs> flowers are look not easy point. here either i think yeah. i think they always have a bit of a challenge um yeah but they are so pretty here They're, yeah so to do. no it's a, it's a good point with the pests um because i'm just thinking like i've seen nasturtiums in the fall in canada and man, they get full of aphids. Like you're pretty, you're pretty much eating more aphids than you are nasturtiums, whether it's leaves or the flowers in the fall here. So I can imagine that, you know, they really attract pests. So I, I would imagine that I didn't even think about that. I'm just thinking, oh, you have such a great climate. It would yeah. be easy to do, but yeah, the pests are definitely a Look, whole other we, challenge. There. We do. We, we're very lucky with our climates. I mean, bar the heat wave this past week, but, um, or actually three weeks, it's been, it's been bleeding hot. It's unbelievable. Um, so yeah, extra fans on the greens and making sure everybody's comfortable, including myself, has not been easy. Um, yeah. <laughs> but so we do, we, we have a great climate. We do get a lot of sun. Um, I think there is a lot of benefits and potential for, for flower growth. But I know the chefs that I work with will want them to be perfect. And so mm. growing outdoors, not like even yeah. with our climate. I mean, it would be one hailstorm. Um, and then that's it. Sorry, guys, no flowers for three, four, five weeks, long time. Yeah. Is it really uh, common to hail there in the summer? In Absolutely. Johannesburg is a thunderstorm city. Um, oh, wow. So we probably get hail every four to six weeks. Um, wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. We have a we have a very angry sky in Johannesburg. So, you know, it's a beautiful day and it's hot and it's blistering. And and then in the late afternoon we get this angry. Rah, a, so we always say, what's the difference? Sorry, Cape Town. I'm from Cape Town, so I can say this. But uh, we always say in Cape Town the the rain's like, and then in Joburg it's like ah. Much like the people, the people are also super hippy to be down in Cape Town. And then in Joburg, we're all hectic. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, Johannesburg is a big city, um, from from what I what I understand. And most people may not realize that it's actually summer where you are right now. It's not. It's not. Or I say fall, but we're almost fall. But uh, yeah, where I am, there's still snow, and it's just crazy to hear, oh, like so you know, wild. like that it's summer where you are. Um, yeah, it but I know. Has, yeah, it has it its own challenges. Incredible how small the world becomes through technology, even though yeah. it does drive me a bit batty. But um, <laughs> yeah, look, I, I, you know, uh, <laughs> not my strong point. Um, but uh, look, I think climate's always going to play a role with any farmer, and mm -hmm. for the most part, uh, South Africa is a wonderfully arable country. Um, Although we are going through a climate shift and the west of Southern Africa is becoming drier, while the east of Southern Africa is experiencing more flood frequency. So, you know, the climate change is certainly having its effect on, on our country and, of course, our growers. A few years ago, Cape Town had a dreadful drought for about two, three yeah. years, um, which, which was concerning. 
But even this summer, I must say it's been quite dry in Johannesburg. Uh, every now and again, it looks like someone took a blowtorch to my garden. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, not that bad. I mean, our water, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's hot. Um, so, yeah, crazy, crazy how we're connected in these different times and spaces. It's very, very yeah. cool. Did Johannesburg so, have have that issue with the the water crisis that Cape Town had, or, or was it no, kind of? We're, we're no. far enough away, and and we have access to quite a large river. Look, we have had drought, but it's never been to the extent where we're not allowed to flush a toilet. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, yeah, I, mean, I, I remember that. It was scary. It was insane. Um, yeah. But look, I will say, Joburg, Johannesburg is the largest man-made forest. So although it's an industrial city where lots is happening all the time and it's so large, um, in some parts it's really green and really beautiful as well. So uh, look, as a Cape Townian living in Johannesburg, I, I enjoy it. It's, it's got a vibe, as we say. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I hope I hope to visit one day. Um, I would love to go to South Africa. Um, but moving on to uh, the challenges. Uh, that you may have faced, what, what, like if you could just wave, uh, you know, a magic wand and solve a problem you have with your business, what would you want to resolve? So I think for me, the biggest problem or is a logistical issue around deliveries, be it microgreens or gut fixes, you know, mm. the, maintaining that cold chain and ensuring that absolutely the highest quality of ingredients is reaching my customer is paramount. Um, and it's not just about the packaging. Of course, the packaging we make sure is insulated and it's nice and cold. But in South Africa, I use a Uber delivery. <laughs> and sometimes I can be driven to absolute madness because they haven't followed an instruction properly or whatever and then I'm in another lesson and now you've got to deal with the delivery man so mm -hmm. I have circumnavigated that headache to a large extent by using a reliable delivery boy who happens to be one of my ex-students um, so Master oh, Bruce cool. is amazing he doesn't uh, you know he doesn't miss a beat and I, I know how clever he is so he's not allowed to make silly mistakes um, <laughs> And, and yeah, he's he's been a great help to the business. I dread the day he graduates and gets a real job. <laughs> uh, that's great. I've business. never I've never actually heard of someone trying to use uh, Uber delivery for migraines. So was yeah. that that's really interesting? I wonder if it's a a, a regional thing. What, like, did you find it was cost effective to deliver with with Uber? Because in Canada, labor right. rates are very expensive. So most people are willing to pay for their own delivery, which is ah. which is good, right? Um, and with the gut fixes, I include a flat delivery rate, um, and uh, it more or less works out. You know, it's it's not so. Some places will be closer, and some places will be further away. Um, and dear old Bruce charges me per trip, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's great. No, I think I think one of the biggest like bottlenecks that I think Microgreens Farms have when they especially when they're doing direct to deliver direct delivery customers to like people's homes is the delivery days become uh, a bottleneck. And it's great that you have uh, one that you one tried something. I think that's the first time I've heard of someone trying to use Uber delivery. Um, and then what's great is that the the cost is going on the consumer, so they want it delivered. They're going to pay. What, what it costs. And now you have moved away from that because it wasn't the best model and have a, um, you know, someone that is pretty much in a way like a contractor or employee, whatever, whatever it is, that's be, that's able to do that for you um, and save you the time because you're, you're obviously very busy working full time, plus running sure. the business, plus cooking. So I can imagine <laughs> that there's not a whole lot of time to, to deliver. So that, that's great that you no, came up with a, a there's, solution there's for that. No ways. There's no ways I could do deliveries. Okay. Like I'm, I could do a lot of things, but I just feel like sitting in traffic, you know, we have load shedding in South Africa. So the robots are out. Um, and I mean, I'm on a tight enough schedule. If I, if I yeah. imagine had to make two hours available a day for deliveries and then was caught in a robot because of load shedding, sorry, uh, traffic lights, we call traffic lights robots here. 
And it's like, uh, I was okay. stuck at a traffic light because the power's out, because, you know, ESCOM, whatever. Um, I'd lose my mind. I'd, I'd be such a miserable person. So, <laughs> no, 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 no. For my sanity and uh, the sake of not experiencing road rage, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's much sure. better to have someone to do deliveries. Absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think that just like clearing up your time to spend more running the business or doing the tasks that need to be done. I think <laughs> deliveries is a very low value add for a business owner to to do. Um, I did I did it for longer than I should have, but it was it was one of the first tasks I gave to staff to do because I knew that my time was better spent growing the business or even even production uh, than delivering. Yeah. So I, I think like it, it sounds like the advice that uh, I, I would give based on your experience is to like hand off that early on because it's a pretty low skilled uh, it's not like a overly Good. complicated thing to do. And uh, a lot of people know how to drive. Yeah. So that's, that's my magic wand. If I could just, you know, sort out logistics, which for the most part is good. Um, I mean, last night we sent got fixes out. Bruce arrived, cooler boxes, keeping everything cool, you know, and I, I don't have to worry about him. I don't have to say, have you done it? Is, is it yeah. it's, it's done. It's off my mind. Um, so yeah, for, for peace of mind and, and also to free space, you know, headspace for yeah. what you are actually doing is so important. So yeah. For sure. That's great. Um, on, on kind of a similar topic, if you could go back to when you started your farm and meet the younger Ashley, oh what advice, <laughs> what advice would you give her to set her up for success in running uh, Metro Greens? Wow. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> do you know, Joan, I'm really happy with what I've done. And I think I have to thank younger me for, for creating the opportunities that I have today. Um, I look back and I, I worked really hard, uh, and I poured so much into it. Um, there really isn't, I think if I could say anything, it would be keep going, you know, like you've got this, keep going, it's worth it, you love it, like, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't think there's anything in my process that would have changed where I am today. I think I had to go through those experiences and to build that knowledge you know yeah i could write a cheat sheet for growing beetroot but <laughs> no i think i think that's 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 really great i think because like every every difficulty or challenge you went through allowed you to learn the lessons you need to learn to get to where you are now and i think that's that's a very uh, that's the first time someone's answered the question like that but i really like that um that <laughs> like you know i wouldn't change anything but i would just give them encouragement which i think is 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 really what a lot of people need starting out is they just need like like i i picture like i always picture this like version of me that's like a zen wisdom 70 year old guy that like can just go back in time and be like all you need is to keep being on the path you are on and just like keep doing you and you'll figure everything out and just like having that uh as you know what you would give your younger self i think is is really a unique perspective most people are like oh i would do this different and do that different but i think it's really cool that you would do everything the same and just like give yourself encouragement which, which is yeah really beautiful thank you oh well thank you jonah that's very kind to say thank you uh, look yeah absolutely i think it's too easy to be hard on yourself and it's too easy to criticize you know it's, Oh, should I have done that market? No. <laughs> but yeah. would it have changed where I am today? I don't I don't think so. Maybe. Maybe I wouldn't have met the people that I met at that market, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And ultimately, I have met a lot of supporters along the way. So, yeah, no no changes to that. Thank you very much. I, I love yeah. it. That's great, yeah. <laughs> For sure. No, that's great. I, I think, I think it's, it, you're right. It's so much easier to, like, look back and be like, oh, I could have done this differently. But you made the decisions at the time that were the best decisions you possibly could have made. Otherwise, you would have made other decisions. So I think it's yeah. like a, a, re a really important thing for people starting out or 
expanding their business to really just think about that like you're you are doing the best you can in any given moment otherwise you would be doing something else absolutely absolutely um and and like i say be kind to yourself if that's the best that you can do at that time it's fine you know what tomorrow's yeah. another day um, and I always say it to the kids because maths and science is obviously practice subject. So practice, practice, practice. And too often we hear that saying, uh, practice makes perfect. We're not looking for perfect, right? Because mm-hmm. perfect today is not perfect tomorrow. Life is dynamic thing and it's constantly changing and evolving. So don't look for perfect because perfect is evolving as well. Yeah. Um, what we must look for is progress. And I mm-hmm. think that if you can look back on any journey, including a microgreen journey, if you can look back and say, yeah, that's, that's progress, you know, I'm reaping the benefits of what I've sowed through connection and through communication and through community, uh, then, then you've done something that truly has a wonderful impact um, and, and hopefully is fulfilling for the person who experiences it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That That's great advice. I think that's... Uh... Uh, wisdom that you that you only can learn by experiencing life. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, this was great. I, I thank you so much, Ashley, for coming on. If listeners want to connect more with you, learn more about uh, your farm or yourself, where can they find you online and on social media? Um, so I am I am a, a purist. I am only on Instagram. <laughs> No, look, I think there's like a background Facebook. I don't know. (laughs) But I never post anything there directly. Yeah, please feel free. Um, My Instagram handle, at Metro Green, ZA. Um, Yeah, if you send me a DM. Otherwise, my website, www.metrogreensza.net.za. It's a mouthful. Find me on the gram. I'm far more responsive <laughs> anyway. Um, but thank you, Jonah. Thanks for, for hosting this. And yeah, thoroughly enjoyed uh, chatting my greens. What fun. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, no, this was, a, this was a super fun episode. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for tuning in to the Mike Green's Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your Mike Green's business, visit MikeGreensConsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of Mike Green's businesses, and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Mike Greens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share Mike Green's magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.